If anything can evoke emotions in me, it's about animals, dogs in particular. Excuse me, all. <laughs> Truly. And actually, I guess in, in some ways that's really what the talk is about this morning, is what she just sang about. That unconditional love. <sighs> Let's just breathe it in right now. If we could aspire to be like our beautiful animals, I'm partial to dogs, because they certainly have taught me a lot. Beautiful song. I actually should get you to write one for Sugar and Zoe and the journey that uh, I've had with them. And, and also this morning, when you were singing, I was thinking about four years that Cheryl and I would be together. Ooh. This is not what I had this talk to start out like this morning at all, trust me. But it is what it is, and that's kind of what healing is about. It's about being with what is. Can we just be right where light is happening? Can we do that? Sometimes we can. But sometimes it's really hard. I guess I should have had a celebration when Melanie was doing the prayer time. Because Cheryl and I will celebrate four years in July. Most of those four years have been this journey. It's been a mystery. It's been a pain in the ass. It's been all kinds of things. But celebrate with me because we are actually going to Helen, Georgia for five days in a cabin this coming week. Take me up there and put me in that cabin, so be it. A mysterious journey about healing. I had a couple of resources that I wanted to offer you this morning. Please excuse me again. From Anita Merjani. How many of you have heard of her? Dying to be me, who had a near death experience. And there's another gentleman, Larry Dossey, who's an MD, and he wrote a book called Healing Words. Why is it, and, and I can use this example as Cheryl, or myself even, years ago when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, or anything else that might have come along. Why is it, when something happens like that, or we hear about a diagnosis, and many of you are going through different things, you know people who are going through different things, why is it that immediately we are reaching out here? We want to see the best doctor. We want to go find the best cure. We want to read the right words. We want to make sure we're thinking the right thoughts. We get very busy, and sometimes it's a way to deal with the fear. It's a way to, to deal with the, the anxiety of what's happening and what has us so scared and so confused and so at a loss. Where are the answers? That's why I had Chris read the longest reading this, this, this community has ever heard. That's the answer. There is no answer. And we spend so much time seeking, trying to find it, asking, what is it? And then we ask, what thoughts am I thinking? Am I a bad person? Did I do something to deserve this? And then what? We're told a new thought. Be careful what you're thinking. You're going to create your experience. I can tell you, when I was attending Unity North for the years that I was, and I went through my breast cancer journey, and I also had a really difficult time with the little Shih Tzu puppy that I had that passed away in a house fire at the age of eight months old. And I lost pretty much everything I own, including my sweet puppy. And things were happening. And, you know, my, my mom was diagnosed with cancer right after, just before my mastectomy. And life, there was all kinds of really not good things that were happening. And I remember a couple of people coming up to me and saying, what are you thinking lately, Jeannie? Where are your thoughts? And I even had one person say, I don't know that I want to spend much time around you anymore. <laughs> and I thought, okay. And in those moments, I mean, new thought was new to me back in 2000 when I first walked into those doors. And I'm no longer in that community, and unfortunately it was a very bitter party with myself and the person who's a minister there now. And that's been another lesson for me, 
in so many ways. Did I have answers when, when things were happening for me? No, I didn't. We say, oh, look at the endless possibilities. Look at the gift. And you want to smack somebody after a while. You really do. In my humanness, I want to say, don't do that. And then I go, oh, Jeannie, don't be so critical. They're teaching you how to be compassionate. They're teaching you how to be understanding. They're teaching you to be forgiving. And after a while, I don't know about you guys, but after a while, it wears me out. It makes me tired. I become exhausted. This journey with Cheryl these last four years, Melanie knows really well, so does Denise. Of all the things, even Susan, when I call on her and her nutrition expert, nutritionist expert, because I'm seeking the answers constantly. Are there any? Where are they? I want to read to you a little something that Larry Dossie has to say. And this is so perfect, I think, because of those of us that are in New Thought. <clears throat> when you think of some of the people, and I will throw Wayne Dyer into the mix right here. How many of you had a difficult time when you heard that he was diagnosed okay with cancer. What was your difficult time? Because he had cancer or because it was like, oh my God, how could somebody like Wayne Dyer get cancer? And I remember somebody else telling me I'm never going to read anything that he's ever written anymore. Because how could somebody like Wayne Dyer get cancer? Oh my goodness. How is that possible? Wayne Dyer? How about Buddha? You know, know how Buddha died? Food poisoning. <laughs> With all that Buddha had to teach? Are you kidding? What was that about? Jiddu, Krishnamurti, the famous spiritual teacher whose words have inspired millions around the world. Cause of death? Cancer of the pancreas. Saints and sinners. Does it mean we're a sinner? If we get something and we can't get rid of it? Or how many of you have heard about somebody who's had breast cancer five times? And we're like going, all right, you can kick it again five times. You'll get another trophy for that. You must have the answer, but it took you four times to get it. And now you've got to do it again. Seriously. How much time do we spend in that? But that's our culture. We're always looking for the answers. We're always trying to figure it out. How willing are you to live in the mystery of not knowing? How many of you are open to walking and standing in uncertainty and simply saying, I don't know. And I'm okay not knowing. But my knowing when I say, I don't know, that's my human self. My higher self already gets it. My higher self already knows the answer for the things, for Tom's job, for Lloyd's job, for anything. The answer is already there. It's already available to us. We get so fixated, F-I-X, fix, fixated on it has to look a certain way or it's got to show up yesterday. And it's got to be exactly at that time. Or like, oh, because if I, if, whoa, 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 whoa. If I think too fast, and I'm going too fast, then I'm not thinking the right thoughts. Then that means I don't have faith. Then it means I'm not doing my prayer work. What is the matter with me? Spiritual multitasking. To where we're working so hard. Did you notice Jesus doing all that stuff? Anybody? How about Buddha? How about any of the ascended masters? Do you see them running around trying to figure it out? No. When Jesus encountered a man who was blind from birth, his disciples asked, Master, who did sin? Man 
for his parents that he was born blind. The question comes in a variety of New Age contexts today. Who is at fault? Why did I choose this illness? Ever heard that one before? For what current or previous shortcomings am I suffering? Maybe this was handed down from another lifetime. Or maybe my great-great-grandmother did something and now I'm, you know, paying the debt for her. We come up with all kinds of explanations, don't we? It's very fascinating. Who's to blame? Jesus' answer is illuminating and should be emblazoned, I love this, emblazoned in every New Age book dealing with consciousness and healing. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And you guys know I don't quote the Bible much, but I had to lay this one on you today because it moved me and it's like, wow. How could Jesus' message be clearer? This is a striking example of a profound physical problem in the total absence of spiritual imperfection. No one fell short. Nobody was being punished for sin. Nobody chose to be sick. Jesus implies also that there may be a higher purpose to the illness that we simply cannot grasp because we do not know the ways of the absolute. That's what I said earlier. In our humanness, in our ego, trying to figure it out, trying to cure this and fix that, put a band-aid on it, make it go away, because I can tell you all the doctors, traditional and alternative, that Cheryl and I have been to in these last three years trying to find a fix for what's happening with her. And what it calls each of us to do in any moment with whatever it is that's going on. But today, we're talking in particularly about health. But health can be not just a physical thing. It can be emotional and mental and spiritual. You know, a psychic, whatever you want to call it. But again, we focus in our culture on we've got to find a cure. The other day I was at Barnes & Noble. I think it's the only one that I'm aware of that's still a bookstore <laughs> over off near Town Center Mall. And I was walking down an aisle and I saw uh, a younger couple sitting on the floor and the, the gentleman looked really athletic and, and his wife was sort of sitting there in a yoga position and I was noticing they were looking at different kinds of uh, cookbooks and such and I saw the paleo diet and, and most of you know that I work with health and wellness and weight a lot and, and help people just to try to find out what's, what's for them. And you know, I'm thinking I'm the bookstore, I'm minding my own business, but I was compelled to say something. Uh, words were coming out of my mouth before I knew it, and I said, oh, so you're reading about, you know, paleo and all that. I said, is that something that you already follow? And they said, uh, well, you know, no, we, we do some other things, but the young woman said that her mother was very, very uh, overweight and was having some issues. Well, the young man stood up, and I swear he must have been seven feet tall. You can tell he really worked out, really buff guy, but he had on this shirt. And it said, F blank CK cancer. And I thought, okay. And I, and I said, do you mind my asking? I said, I, I went through a breast cancer journey myself a number of years ago. Uh, do you mind my asking what your shirt is about? And he said the words again. And he said, our six-year-old daughter. <laughs> okay, listen to what you're doing right now. Oh. Did she choose cancer? Is it part of her journey? Well, what do you think this couple's trying to do? They're trying to figure it out. Perhaps if we had them here right now, they'd say, maybe we've been through the laundry list of questions and asked ourselves those very questions. What can we do to make it better? We do that every week here when Melanie and, and Sydney are praying. What can we do to support you? How do we hold the space for you? What is the answer? What would you say to them? So he stood there and I could feel his emotion. And he said she's already been through, she's sick, she's already been through two or three years of treatments and she still has another year to go of some type of radiation and something else. And, and I could feel my heart going out to them. And so I pulled out my card and I gave him my card. And I said if there's anything 
that I can do for you. Just to listen with your mom, I know you're upset about your mom, whatever I can do. So in that moment, it's almost like the quote on the bulletin this morning. When the healing is there, then go out and heal. Go out and shine your light. Shine your light. <coughs> Sickly saints and healthy sinners show us, show us that there is no invariable, linear, one-to-one -one relationship between one's level of spiritual attainment and degree of one's physical health. It is obvious that one can attain immense <coughs> spiritual heights and still get very sick. How does that feel when you hear those words? Do you have the belief within you that if you eat right, you do your prayer work, you be a good person, and you do all those things that perhaps you were taught when you grew up, that you won't ever get sick? Or if it happens, you sure as heck won't get cancer because that's the biggie that's out there. I'm inviting you this morning to just dance in that mystery, to dance in that question, and to know that somewhere within you, it's just like what I read, in our humanness, there aren't the answers, there aren't, those, there aren't the things that are going to bring us peace. It's in the place of the absolute. It's in accessing that realm. That's where Anita Marjani comes in. She had what's called an NDE, a near-death experience. This woman, for four years, had a journey fighting cancer, fighting it, doing everything she could to make it go away. And in her book, she talks about, if, if you've never read this, I really encourage you to get it. It's a, it's a marvelous, marvelous book. And if, just like anything else, it gives you something else to just be with from a very different perspective. Her biggest thing now is about loving yourself. That's the message that she brought back, if you will, from the other side. But for the four years from the time she was diagnosed with cancer, she talks about in her book, she went to every guru, every doctor, people prayed and chanted and you name it, she probably covered everything on that list. Eventually she ended up in a wheelchair Eventually, she ended up leaving her body because she had physically, literally died. And when her soul left her body and she had the opportunity to cross the veil, it was like, oh my goodness, I'm not ready to, to be here. I get it. And not everybody has that same experience. A lot of people have different accounts of when they maybe have had a near-death experience and what that's been about for them. But I'm just really focusing on hers because the thing that she brings us back to is about living authentically. About living your life. Because what she says is that she was so focused on living the life that her culture, Indian culture, was was constantly imposing upon her to live. The, the marriage that was arranged, all the different things that women in her culture were supposed to aspire to do and to be. And she never really had that sense of freedom to be who she was to live her own life. So when she, in this book, she talks about all the different things that she finally recognized and realized in terms of being authentic. And also, she really calls you to take a look at what it is you believe, and she goes even further. She asks you to let go of everything that you believe. Everything. Because often, those are the obstacles that get in our way. Those are the very things that we stumble over. Because we are so confined and limited by those beliefs, you know, and a new thought, I, I know for a lot, and I, I'm right here with you, when I first got in the new thought, I thought, oh my God, I'm so free now. You know? I I'm not in that Baptist dogma that I grew up in. I'm not in whatever. You know, I I'm free. I can think my own thoughts. I don't have to, 
you know, believe that God's going to strike me down, all those kinds of things. I thought, woohoo, I have hit the spiritual lottery. <laughs> I am free to think my own thoughts. Oh my. <laughs> now what? And I know after the first couple of years of getting a new thought, they say that, that chemicalization that happens because there's such an influx of so many things and there's so much going on, and after a while it's like, you know, oh my gosh, overwhelmed. But I think sometimes there's a little bit of a cockiness in New Thought folks, too. And we're very prone, I think, at times, if something's happening with someone, or we hear out there, hmm, I wonder what they were thinking, like I said earlier. And we, what do we do? There's that J word, judgment. We go into judgment, and we start pointing fingers and saying, well, they would just do what? And I remember being a crazy, you know, unitic lunatic at the very beginning. And saying, here, here's the five principles. Take these five principles. And if you apply these to your life, oh my gosh, that's the ticket, folks. You got it made. You know what I say to that now? You don't want to know. No. <laughs> what I say to that now is create your own. You are a creative being. That is your essence. That is your divine nature. That is your divine nature. Anita Rajani says, I want to clarify that my healing wasn't so much born from a shift in my state of mind or beliefs as it was from finally allowing my true spirit to shine through. Your authentic self, your higher self. It wasn't my beliefs that caused me to heal. My NDE, my near-death experience, was a state of pure awareness, which is a state of complete suspension of all previously held doctrine and dogma. Get out of your head. Lose your mind. And allow yourself to be open to that other realm. Your, your true essence and spirit, that divinity, that is you, your essence. She said, this allowed my body to reset itself. In other words, and this is just her perspective, an absence of belief was required for my healing. How willing are you to suspend your beliefs and to be willing to stand in the mystery to dance in the questions, to be in that place. How willing are you to do that? I want to leave you this morning with the word heal because it has so many different ways to be interpreted. And on that first letter of that word, Honor yourself. Honor you. You're not like anybody else in this room or anybody else on this planet. Honor yourself. Respect yourself. And in that honoring of you, it is to learn to be honest with you. You know when you're lying to yourself. <clears throat> Just be honest with you in the best way that you know how. And let that energy begin. Just let that energy begin to move and to be infusing you. Embrace your essence. Whatever your understanding of that is right now, be open to a broader, expanded understanding because that is you. You are the vastness of the blue sky today when you leave here. That, to me anyway, is you. Emma's, embrace your essence. You are so beautiful. And the A is authentic, as I mentioned earlier. And in that place of authenticity, you access that absolute realm. If God is in you and as you, whatever word you want to call God, you're already 
that. But to be open to accessing and allowing and allowing and allowing. Endless. That's God. Infinite, yes? Endless, yes? Allow your authentic and amazing self to shine through. And of course, you know the L is love. It is not selfish for you to fall in love with you and to love yourself unconditionally every single day. Have an endless, lifelong romance to where you are just letting it flow. And when you do that, everything changes. Everything changes. The quote I want to leave you with to close this talk is by Anita Marjani. Be the love that you are and allow your answers to come from within in the way that is the most appropriate for you. That's the answer. There aren't any. Love yourself. Love yourself. Namaste.